Paul's building the world, 1974-1996, lost into Petronas Towers, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Shorter than fours in us, those twin office towers in uh, Kuala Lumpur. So what they do, they spire for 25 feet. By the way, my Toronto group, you know, um, your uh, CN Tower in Toronto is in a separate category. They don't call it a building because of how it comes out of a post. They consider that uh, CN Tower in uh, Toronto as a structure. That's a whole nother, whole, whole nother level. And I think you probably know the tallest building in the world today, made it in the papers a lot. That would be the British Khalifa in Dubai, which stands 2,717 feet. It's not in Chicago. <laughs> do not fret, do not cry. Who is the architect of the Burj Khalifa Dubai? Chicago guy, Adrian Smith, that did the NBC Tower and the Trump Hotel, also did Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Now, let's talk a little bit about the postmodern movement, because we have a great postmodern building coming up. Look all the way over to the right. You'll see a building with an old-fashioned roof of green gables, although to my knowledge, nobody named Ann ever lived in there. That's a modern office building by Philip Johnson and John Berkey, 1987. Now, Philip Johnson, very famous for his glass house, he's a dyed-in-the-wool, old-school, you know, uh, international-style model. So you surround yourself with corporate towers, and those tenants provide revenue. Everyone wants to know why does the typeface say Civic Opera a building with a V instead of a U up there? Well, if you use a certain early Latin alphabet, you don't have the letter U to choose from. With its surrounding towers, it does indeed look like a throne chair. So in 1928, people started calling this building Insel's Throne. For the man who commissioned the building, Samuel Insel, was indeed a king of electricity. He put everyone in the Midwest on the power grid. Now Insel's Throne was facing west, turning its back to the east. Now, some tour guides will claim to you that that's because of Sam's girlfriend. She was an opera singer, but she was just not that good. She was turned down by the New York Mets. Sam got mad, built an entire building in the shape of a chair, so he could turn his back on New York City and its opera and pout <laughs> in a grandiose manner. And you know what I'd call that? A whopper, a fish story, a tall tale. I would not believe one word of it. The problem is tour guides won't give it up. They've been telling that silly story for 50 years. Yes, our deco looks like a chair. There is a physical, mundane reason there. We will discuss it later. One block away, you name it the Haymarket Pub and Restaurant. You name all your brews after the historical figures of the day, both the policemen and the labor activists. You attempt to educate with each and every draft. So if you do go get a picture of the monument, you can go try the bratwurst and beer at the pub. Now, friends on the right, I know you're looking at the boats, but I do want to get in these three buildings as well. They're all by Colin Pedersen and Fox and the Pink Tower 311 South Wacker. I love this room because they're very contextual. You can see what they're reflecting around them. If you look at the 2004 building, it has an exposed square at the top. And from this angle, it's a ghost image of a clock tower, the Boeing building, a conscious uh, reference right there. Let's focus on this middle building. Can't get enough of 330 West Wacker Drive. Cone Pedersen Box 1983. Now this particular building is so striking. It was the cornerstone that revitalized Chicago's business district in the 1980s. And look how everything's about the river. The art mimics a bin we take with a boat, the glass reflects architecture and skyline, and all the symbols in the lobby, housing, the air conditioning. Now here's another visual rhyme. And this one you have to look at both sides of the river to get it taking photos, you'd have to get two pictures because first I want you to notice the support columns, one on that end, two in the middle, and one here. Look close, they are octagonal in shape, look closer, and they have strands of green marble uh, throughout the block, right? Just like the band. Now, to see the reference they were making, just like Doctor Who and the TARDIS, we'll go back in time, to 1930, and look at the corner of the Merchandise Mart, right here above the bridge. Look at the corners, you have the same octagonal geometry. Can you see that? It's a conscious reference. Since you have that common design element, and since you can think of the buildings as having an architectural conversation in a somewhat Disney and anthropomorphic sense across the river there. As a concept, yeah, many businesses under one roof. Finally, Mr. Hartford, who started the A&P grocery store chain. A&P, of course, that longtime famous grocer. Not to mention being the name of the short story set in an A&P. Which, by the way, is one of the best examples of a short story you can read and study, A&P by the writer John Updike. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about the roadway that went in Wacker Drive. Vernon conceived it. Oh, by the way, the seating just went in uh, two week in, weeks ago. This is this Riverwalk idea, what we're trying to do. And this is what we really want to see, people hanging out. 
the Riverwalk was really fully realized right here. This beautiful little park on our right, already been here about five years, is our Illinois Vietnam War Veterans Memorial Wall. It is such a favorite of Chicagoans for a moment of quiet repose. And this is what we see people hanging up. Every time I see people sitting under these trees, it reminds me of my own open air university. My teacher was named Socrates. That was so long ago. Now, look in front of the Aon Center, two buildings of note with Spire and Chevron Roof from the mid-90s. That's two Prudential Plaza, postmodern Art Deco, obviously Chrysler building influence. Come forward, see the dark green Art Deco building with the 50-foot gold top? Looks like a giant bottle of champagne, no? That's the Hard Rock Hotel. Now, the champagne design, many people will argue that was intentional. You see, the building dates back to Prohibition when you could not legally have a bottle of champagne. It was designed by the Burnham Brothers, Dan Jr. and you, for the Union Carbide Company. What do you think? Many people think that champagne design may have been a little editorial comment on how they felt about Prohibition. Above my favorite Riverwalk Cafe, O'Brien's, the skinniest skyscraper in Chicago, 75 East Wacker Drive, only nine and a half of the cross that octagonal crown. Now that building is clad with terracotta, as was the Hard Rock Hotel, as is the Jewelers Building and the Wrigley Building. Why do you think terracotta? Terracotta is so popular on buildings after the Great Chicago Fire. Well, obviously it looks great. You can color it, you can glaze it. Most important, terracotta being fired clay is fireproof. That was exactly it. You know, what people forget is that it's the merchants who bankroll a lot of these buildings. You hear about the architect. But there wasn't a merchant who was going to pay a penny until you, in, in, unless you insured him that his building was going to be as safe as possible. Four-letter word, it's going to be the father, E-L-I-E-L. -E -E if you need a four-letter word, it will be the son architect, Aero, E-R-O. And the thin man's dog is always Asta, and the Guthrie is never Woody, it's almost always Arlo. <laughs> Friends, NBC Tower on the left, you see it from this perspective. You know, I meant, I did say in Art Deco, it's like a um, reinterpretation of history. This is still reinterpretation, but getting very close to imitation. Yeah. Oh, wow. Adrian Smith with the NBC Tower here, really, really... It really looks as close as you could possibly get to being an Art Deco building to me. In and friends, I want to take another look at Big John, the John Hancock Center. I consider this the most Chicago of our skyscrapers. It was Bruce Graham and Dr. Fosler Khan before the Sears Tower, the first of our giants, 1969. I would urge you, please, stroll down Michigan Avenue and end up at the base of the John Hancock Center. It's beautiful, distinctive taupe tapering profile, not unlike an Egyptian obelisk or the Washington Monument. Go to the 94th floor and see the window jumping out at you. That is called Tilt. That opened last summer. To compete with the sky deck at the, on the Sears Tower, Tilt is a glass box with eight windows. You step in and you hold on for dear your life because they're going to tilt you 30 degrees in thin air. No one knows why, they just do it. Now, <laughs> if you'd rather just chillax, and I can actually say the word chillax now, I've made it into the Oxford English Dictionary. If you want to relax, go up to the 95th floor restaurant and lounge. It is family friendly called the Signature Room, where the best view of the entire lakefront of Chicago is a floor to ceiling window located only inside the ladies' restroom. Ladies, you get the best view. This is no story. I've had that verified by 568 ladies on this very floor. And on our right, friends, we're passing Illinois Center, a huge air rights project. Mies van der started above the former Illinois Central Monday morning rail yards. Remember Harry Weiss and his charming river cottages. Look how Harry Weiss breaks up the orthodox boxes of his fellow modernists with a triangular Swiss hotel. A gentleman gets off the boat the other day and he says, tell me, did you, Mr. Harry Weiss, give the Swiss hotel that blue triangular design? Was he conscious that it would look like a giant Swiss Toblerone chocolate candy bar? No, no, no. I don't think the architect was thinking candy. Let's call that a bit of Jungian synchronicity. What do you think he was really doing? Architecture does not happen in a vacuum. Why would he use a triangle? He worked years before all the new condos of Lakeshore East were even dreamed up. So what he was really doing was finding the best way to get the most surface area of the building possible and orientation towards the lake. Front. It's kind of what you're after. On our left, friends, we're passing uh, City Front Center. It includes the Sheraton Hotel a little behind us. City Front Place rentals, River Route 1 and 2, and this beautiful fountain. This fountain is Centennial Fountain, designed by Mies van Gros Brands and architect Gert Lohan, 1989, 100th anniversary of the group that diverse the River Chicago Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. At the top of the hour, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., that water cannon will shoot an 80 foot arc for five minutes across a 220 foot span of the river. Hey, and there's that Chicago flag again with its two blue bars, its three white stripes, its four red stars. Yeah, you see, people always ask me that question, so I'd like to explain the flag. Let us now deconstruct the Chicago flag. 
the Chicago flag. Now there are two blue bars, there are three white stripes, there are four red stars. The top blue bar, Lake Michigan, Chicago River, North Branch, there you are. The bottom blue bar, South Branch, Yellow River, Sanitary Ship Canal that travels far. Now the three white stripes, that's the sides of the city. There's a north side, south side, west side. We never think about the east side unless you go for a ride on the road right here. We call it Lake Shore Drive. The four red stars are the fort, the fire, the fair, and the fair. 1803 Fort Dearborn, Michigan Avenue, right back there. 1871, the Great Chicago Fire, downtown everywhere. Now the third star is 1893. Anyone been to Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry? If you're inside there, last building standing on the Columbian Exposition World's Fair. And let's not forget the 1933 Century of Progress World's Fair, the fourth star. Ask an older gentleman who was there, what do you remember of Chicago 33? He'll say Sally Rand was the one for me. Sally Rand was the fan dancer. She showed up at the World's Fair wrapped in two swan feather fans, but she forgot her dress. But everybody said her dance made the fair worth attending. <laughs> so we're upset and took her to court. The Chicago judge threw the case off. I looked up his comments in the Chicago Tribune's 150 Days of Chicago History book they wrote for the sesquicentennial. You know what the judge wrote? Yes, well, a lot of people would probably like to put pants on horses. Case dismissed. Let the lady dance. <laughs> That's why Chicago was a city that Billy Sunday couldn't shut down. Friends, in, uh, let's come back to Lake Point Tower. Shipwright and Heinrich Architects. You know they were inspired by the glass skyscraper vision, just a sketch Mies had done back in Berlin back in the 1920s. The circle at the very top is a high-end French dining experience called Cité. I forced myself on your behalf to go up there after work one night and have a glass of wine or three with a service bartender so I could check out the 360-degree table settings of the menu. I go up there for dinner. The views are absolutely spectacular to monitor how much water can escape. Sure, it was a problem, but we fixed it because we're Chicagoans, that's what we do. And never was that Chicago attitude more evident, friends, than after that great Chicago fire, which mythopoetically speaking still determines our character today. Imagine the day after the fire, a third of the city is gone, 100,000 homeless. Now, it is said there were maybe 14 structures on the horizon in the burned out district, and yet the builders stood there looking for a sign of hope. The smoke clears, and like unto a dream, your visitor center, the water tower, would appear before them, and they thought, we will rebuild the city. And the unofficial model for Chicago since that very day has always been, I will. The builders did rebuild Chicago with embers burning their feet, picked up the trash, garroted it down here, threw it in the water, where it expanded the shoreline, Lake Point Tower standing on man-made shoreline, debris from the fire of 1871. The builders seemed to know that like the mythical phoenix, the city of Chicago would rise from its own ashes. That's the city surrounding us today, and we conclude our cruise. Thank you all for coming out. My name is Kevin McGuire. I'll be waiting for you all at the top of that ramp as you disembark to say goodbye and get questions over from the boarding photos. By captain's orders, please everyone must remain seated for the duration of the docking procedure, and we will end the tour with one final note. Chicago's an architectural gym, but it's also home to its musical style, the Chicago Blues. This is indeed Chicago Blues Fest weekend. So here's a little thing my own I call the architecture blues. She runs uphill. I said Chicago River. Where the river runs uphill, wrong direction. Well, let's go to the city where the motto, the motto is I will. 